Welcome to another episode of I'll Take a Shot at That. I am Matthew Undershot, your host. I am joined tonight by Justin, who's currently pouring us a shot. Justin, what are we drinking tonight, buddy? Um, good question. We're drinking uh, Ramazzotti, Ramazzotti from Milano, and I'm pouring the... Uh, that's very nice. It's dark oh, and evil. Sound. Dark rather, and evil. Rather like me. There we go. Well, welcome to the show. Um, for those of you who don't know, this is I Will Take a Shot at That, a podcast for thinkers, wanderers, and drink and ponderers. I am your host, Matthew Hendershot. You can check us out, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, all at Take a Shot at That, and of course, patreon.com slash take a shot at that if you'd like to support the show. Tonight, we are doing shots of amaretto, so why don't we take a shot at getting the show started? What do you say, Justin? I think that's a fantastic idea. Cheers, man. Cheers. Cheers. Mmm. Oh, it's a great way to start the weekend. Oh, it really is, right? Yeah, absolutely. It's Friday here in Germany. Justin, I want to talk to you because you are the official I'll Take a Shot at That historian. Okay. And uh, we are dealing with something historic that is also very personal for you, uh, which is the Brexit. We've just recently yeah. gone through this weird Brexit Shit show. Yeah, yeah. You know, why, don't, why don't you just explain it to me? Okay, so um, well, what just happened a couple of days ago was that the Prime Minister, uh, Theresa May, had negotiated uh, an exit deal with the European Union, which would, uh, which basically regulated the terms under which the, the UK would leave the European Union. It had nothing to do with uh, how things would be afterwards. There was no discussion yet about the future relationship. It was literally just, it was a, it was a divorce package. Just how, how we get out the door. Basically, it was a divorce package. And everybody hated it. Everyone hated it. So the people on the right hated it because it still tied Britain in. Effectively, what it was going to do was they were going to keep most of the regulations, most of the transfer of goods and services and people would be unaffected for a period of grace um, ending in 2020. And in that time, the idea was they would negotiate the future relationship, any trade deals and so on and so forth. <laughs> it is like a divorce, right? It is absolutely like a divorce. Uh, and the people on the right said, nah, that's going to tie us into the EU still. We're still going to have to basically be their bitch. We're, we're still going to have to do what they ask of, of us. Um, this is no good. And and the biggest problem had to do with, with Northern Ireland. So Northern Ireland's part of the UK, but it shares a border with the Republic of Ireland, which is part also part of the EU. And um, until quite recently, two religions fought each other quite heavily up in Northern Ireland. Sure. And one of, the, one of the deals of the peace settlement in Northern Ireland was that both the UK and the Republic of Ireland would commit themselves to really uh, trying to engender prosperity in that, in that area. And of course, as a result of that, and because of the EU, there's been massive trade between Northern Ireland and the Republic in the South. And that's basically facilitated by an open border. So you can have a business in Belfast, you can have your office in Dublin, and you can transfer between the two without any hassle, no border checks, and so on and so okay. forth. Okay. So the Republic of Ireland wants to keep that in place. But the British want to, of course, protect their own borders. They want to say, well, part of the reason we're leaving the EU is we want to make sure that we can decide what comes in and what goes out. But more importantly, who comes in and who goes out. Okay. And so the EU said, well, how about this? Right, are they, I'm sorry, are they worried yeah. about Irish people coming in too? No, of course they're not. They're worried about brown and black people coming oh, in. But their okay. big fear, of course, is that brown and black people will be able to come into Ireland because Ireland's part of the EU. Uh, and, and, and then they just... Uh... It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a bullshit argument. Because, of course, the only people who have unfettered access uh, to the UK at the moment are members of other EU states. Right. So that's the Greeks, the Swedish, the Finns, the Poles. Right. They, they have to they're be in Europe. already. They have to be in. So the idea that they're going to be swamped by Syrians or people from sub-Saharan Africa is, is, is effectively horseshit because these people aren't members of the EU. And so they are subject to whatever immigration laws the British want to impose. Yeah, mm. but there's some kind of fear that the rest of the EU is the soft touch, and there'll be lots of people coming in the Republic of Ireland and then sneaking across the border into Northern Ireland, <laughs> and then from Northern Ireland sneaking into the UK and I don't know, raping the Queen in her bed or something <laughs> like that. I mean, it just like uh, it, can you okay? So the Brexit deal, obviously, okay, the the European Union is not without its flaws, sure. of course, of uh, course, but it. it wasn't there a whole thing with like when the Brexit referendum actually happened that people didn't know what was what they were actually voting for yes. Or, or yes and so how is it how how come no we haven't just had like a giant all right hold on time out time out okay blow the whistle and say like hey, can we put that all away like we fucked up we didn't know what we were actually talking about 
now that we understand what it actually all means, we don't want that. Well, absolutely. There's, Can we get like a do-over? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's there's um, there's an article. So the the European Union is governed by um, the, the Lisbon Treaty, which was a very elaborate sort of um, uh, formulated treaty, which all members uh, member states signed. And Article Fifty is basically the article of the treaty that governs the exit of member states from the European Union. And so uh, the rule is that if a member state invokes Article 50, they have uh, effectively two and a half years to wrap up their affairs with the EU and then they're out. And if that ever gets extended, that has to then be uh, agreed upon by all the remaining members of the EU. Now, what the European uh, Court of Justice has said, which is kind of the, the main court of the EU, has said that the British can retract Article 50 at any time. Okay. So they can send another letter before the deadline runs out and say, you know what, we've changed our mind, we're withdrawing Article 50, we want to stay in the EU, and it's done. So that's the legal advice of the day. They basically say, if the British government basically was to send a second letter to the EU in Brussels saying, we withdraw Article 50, we're no longer intending to leave, it's done, it's over. End of story, they stay in the EU, same rules apply, that's the way it is. So, so why hasn't? Why not that? Because... Because they actually want out? Some people actually want out. It's well, Yeah, some people definitely want out. Some people, there is, there is a, a hardcore faction of the ruling party, uh, the Conservative Party, that somehow has it in their head that the EU is an amalgamation of Hitler, Napoleon, Attila the Hun... <laughs> the Catholic Church and everything in between. Well, I mean, yeah, there was the classic EU joke that uh, everybody knew eventually Germany would conquer Europe. It just took them several years in a European Union Absolutely. to do it. But <laughs> yeah, and there is a <laughs> That's point. It's not really accurate at all. But... It's definitely not accurate. And the Germans would argue with, with justification that they're actually putting themselves in the EU to stop themselves from. So the EU protects Germany against its worst behavior. <sighs> So the Germans say, if we're in a community of nations and we're tied to those community of nations, then it makes it less possible for us to invade them when we get twitchy. <laughs> yeah, okay. So this is really, this was Just the Invade post them financially when it suits them. Well, our, yeah, but this well. was really the post-war dream. It was, if you think, the EU was set up as, as an initial uh, free trade association that was started by six nations. And the most extraordinary thing was that the, the drivers behind this idea were Germany and France. Two arch rivals had been at each other's throats since the 1870s and less than 10 years after the Second World War. Yet Germany was what? Three years. Uh, West Germany we're talking about now. Only mm. existed as a new fresh sovereign state for three years. And they and the French got together and said, OK, we are never, ever going to have any more wars in Europe. And of course, yes, they were. They were. um thinking about the sort of the free market version. So if people are trading with each other, they're not going to fight each other. That was definitely in their mind. Right. You open the borders to each other's goods and services. You get on well with each other. There's no need to send in the tanks. And right. that was the idea. And so the six original nations then in the mid-1950s set up the Treaty of Rome, which then governed this European economic community. And it was effectively a little bit like NAFTA. It was initially just mm. a free trade zone. But... As time evolved, and, and it grew quite slowly, the British initially tried to join in the 1960s, and the French said, go fuck yourself, we're not interested. <laughs> so it was de Gaulle who did not like the British at all. He had some very sour memories of the British when he was in exile during the Second World War. He thought they slighted him. He thought they didn't take him seriously. So when the British came cap in hand, de Gaulle said you got your American friends, go play with them. We're not interested in you, yeah? So it was only until the 1970s that um, Britain was finally uh, um, allowed to join the EU and they held a referendum at the time um, of, of the British people to see if they'd agree. And interestingly, back then, it was the people on the right, so it was the Conservatives who were pushing for EU membership oh. and it was the left who were saying, we don't want any part of this because at the time it was very much an economic unit, and they thought that it would be exchange of cheap labor, the unions were worried about that their guys would be underbid by workers from other countries, and so on and so forth. So they pushed against it. Is this what led to the whole, uh, the UK kept the pound? 
Yes, uh, that's certainly part of that, that the UK didn't become part of the euro. But the other thing that, that that's worth remembering is that this has all changed since then. So in the 19, it was the Conservatives, interestingly, the government that's now pushing for leave. They were the ones that got Britain into the EU. And over time, um, it became it evolved into a much bigger um, entity. They started to invite member states from the Mediterranean who mm -hmm. had only recently adopted democratic structures like mm -hmm. Spain and Portugal and Greece and so on and so forth. Ireland joined at the same time as the UK. Um, and then, of course, when the when the, the wall came down and the end of communism occurred, then they started to admit member states from what was formerly the Eastern Bloc. Mm -hmm. And the idea shifted so that in 1992, it became the European Union. So they started to also create a political union. Um, and then they started to introduce things like the fact that EU citizens can live and work anywhere in each other's countries, uh, even extending the the voting franchise, which, of course, is usually very, very protected. Nations usually say only our citizens are allowed to vote in our elections. In local elections in the EU, EU citizens are allowed to vote. So even before I became a German citizen, I was allowed to vote in, in, in the city elections oh, here in Leipzig well, as, as a Brit. And any Greek or Italian or, or Danish or Dutch uh, resident of Leipzig would have been allowed to vote for City Hall and vote for the mayor. And, of course, the European elections for the European Parliament. Is it, um, and maybe this is a drastic change in, in topic to ask this question, but is the what are the primary... Is it simply immigration, like this fear of immigration that is the primary motivator for, for uh, Britain to leave? I or, think so. Yeah? Yeah, I think so. It's, I think it's a classical... Um, I, what's happened is Britain has been gripped by austerity for the last... Well, since the crash that happened in 2008. Well, and they're, they're not alone in that, right? I mean, we exactly. saw what happened in Greece. Italy's going through a ton of... Exactly. I mean, Italy's basically a technocracy now. Like, the European government sent... Like, here's your new leader. We decided. Like, the Italian people had no say in that matter at a certain Indeed. point. Mario Monti. Uh, was like, yeah, yeah, the, exactly. Well, it's a similar thing because the conservative government was in power then, and they basically then introduced their, their wet dream, which was basically slash public services, introduce massive austerity, cut public spending, cut welfare, um, allow people to, to basically hire and fire. They tried to... Well, they basically tried to get the state out of the economy. And, of course, what's happened is things are going on in the UK that nobody thought would still be possible, that people are basically relying on food banks, that people are homeless because they can't keep their homes, that uh, the public health sector is completely overburdened and so on and so forth. So there is a real deep resentment in the UK. And, of course, the whole switch and bait, what happens is the powers that be say, well, it's the reason why your life sucks isn't because we've taken all the money away. The it reason your life sucks the is the immigrants. You, yeah. yeah. And so um, uh, the polling certainly suggests... Well, that and, and you have too many things. Like, yeah. You have too much health care. We need some of that back because it's costing us a lot of money, so we're going to take some of that. And, and that's why you're having such a hard time finding a doctor or whatever. Exactly. And of course, the, the same lies were peddled that uh, are peddled in any kind of anti-immigration rhetoric, the idea is that immigrants are taking the jobs away, <laughs> that immigrants are a burden on the welfare state, even though... There's a really funny thing. Like Everybody thinks that like uh, the, uh, the, the conservative argument is uh, first that like, oh, all these people are coming in, they're terrorists, yeah, right. they're rapists, yeah, they're yeah. criminals. Yeah. But they're taking our jobs. And yeah. I'm like, what the fuck do you do for a living that they're taking your jobs? This <laughs> is this is of course the other thing. Absolutely. Um and um what the people were also pointing to was um um when when the Eastern European states joined the EU a lot of them did. It did lead to quite a quite a migration from east to west. So, particularly in the UK, there was a massive migration of Poles, Polish people coming then at the early twenty first century, coming to Britain, settling. Most of them, though, um, became very successful. So they took on jobs. They opened up corner shops. Mm. The the there was this sort of um, the image of the Polish plumber uh, who could do your who could basically do your plumbing for half the work in half the time 
and twice as efficiently and with higher quality than the local okay. British pub hey. plumber. Yeah, that sounds but, great. But it sounds great. It's it was unless good you're thing. a British plumber. Well, exactly. But the other thing is, is that people were also noticing that a lot. So yes, yeah, some did settle absolutely, but many also stayed for let's say ten years and then went back to their home countries. Mm-hmm. And of course, the interesting thing that people ignore when they're talking about, you know, the Polish plumbers or the people from Bulgaria and Romania, there was this whole racist idea that Romanian gypsies were basically taking over organized crime and white slavery and the drug trade and so on and so forth. What they were overlooking from the fact that it's a two-way street. So if you go to the Spanish coast, for example, you will see tens of thousands of British retirees. Mm, yeah, so okay. So living the life with their British pension in a cheap little villa on the Spanish coast, basically availing themselves of the Spanish health service and having sun 360 days a year. Mm. So this is this is the bit that people overlook. And also when they also talk about Europeans coming to the UK to uh, avail themselves of the health service, the National Health Service. Firstly, that's not entirely true because member states can restrict access to the welfare program for mm. other EU citizens. And secondly, British also go abroad to the EU to, to, to get treatment because the NHS being a state-run health service means that the waiting lists usually are quite long. You mm. have to, if you need a hip transplant or something like that, it might just be cheaper to go to Italy or to go to Slovakia or to go somewhere else and get it done there. And that's never discussed, ever. It's all about them coming to us. And it's well, a I special that, kind of... That's a classic I know, but it's a special is... kind of arrogance to assume that the UK is that desirable, is that attractive, that there are hordes <laughs> and hordes of people. Yeah, it, it, yeah, but... Yeah, I mean, it, if you're just like base-level immigrant and your choice is like London, rainy, expensive... That's it. Tough time, or like body in, in the south of Italy, or something like that, or some go. beautiful place. Like, why would you? You, you gotta. They, they, I guess you're kind of right. That's a very like um, inflated ego thing to be sure. like. Well, they all want to be here where we are. It's like, well, there's also like Spain and Italy and all these beautiful places that they could go. Also, yeah. Like, I don't know. It's a very confusing stance. It's, it's nuts. Um, and but that's but that's the the bullshit that people are being fed. And um, is, is how much of it is just like political rhetorical hype machines where you know conservatives versus liberals are just sort of like spouting whatever for re-election purposes. And like, how much of this is like legitimate gripes that? Britain can have against the European Union? Um, that's a very good question, I would say. I mean, in terms of, um, roughly speaking, you can divide the people in favor of Remain and the people in favor of leaving um, demographically, that younger people want to remain, older people want to leave. That's interesting. Yeah. Geographically, it's quite clear that Scotland and Northern Ireland voted to stay um, whereas England and Wales voted to leave. And when you look within England and Wales, of course, the urban areas, so the multicultural cities voted overwhelmingly to stay and the rural areas voted overwhelmingly to leave. The areas which will, of course, be most heavily affected, ironically, when they leave. Yeah, I, that's a, that's very that's something I can understand pretty easily. The location thing, because that's that's very American uh, mirrored as well. Like the rural areas lean more conservative, where the the major cities tend to lean more liberal. The curious thing about what you just said is the young people versus the old people. Yeah, because in America, the trend sort of seems to be that young people are leaning more to the conservative side right. of things whereas people who are you know the the kind of i, I guess air quotes burnt out grown up hippies yeah, yeah now yeah. they still are very liberal but yeah. there's a lot of young people um who are who are like hey that my money i want to keep it i'm gonna be anti-taxes i'm gonna be anti-public services i'm gonna be kind of be very selfish and it yeah. seems like that part is kind of flipped upside down what you're telling me i think uh, it has partly to do with the fact that younger people of course take more advantage of the freedom of movement the EU has to offer. Uh, yeah, we don't really have it. Yeah, America. so, I mean, if you go up to Berlin, for example, nowadays, you will hear English being spoken on the streets, and I'm talking my accent. Oh, yeah, English. everywhere. So English, English people from the UK... Um, yeah, I've encountered that, that all over the place. And for them, I mean, in this sort of globalized economy where people can be digital nomads, it's probably cheaper to live in Berlin 
and to fly into London every now and then when you have to have meetings. Jesus, you know, how much money do you have to have for that to be a true statement? Cheaper to live in Berlin and just fly to London when you well, catch a whim? I, well, <laughs> if you if you look at if you uh, certainly the 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 cost of you've rent, already eliminated like sixty percent of of the populace by how much money you'd have to have for that to be realistic. Not necessarily, because if you think how much it costs to live in London, it's outrageously expensive. Yeah, but it also costs a lot of money to live in Berlin. It does cost, but not. I mean, compared to London, it would still be cheaper, and you can get these cheap flights that go from Berlin Schönefeld to Stansted. It is. I'm sure there are quite a. All right. If you're not, right. I mean, I'm not saying commuting that you're going in every morning and flying out every <laughs> night. I'm saying be a trip, you it? basically you you live online, you work online, and then maybe once or twice a month you have to go in for meetings or uh, okay. checking with clients. Okay. Yeah. And the EU affords that, so I think younger people in particular would 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 be, or it doesn't have to be Berlin. It can also be you know Lisbon or or Barcelona. Yeah, sure. Or and like I'm that. sure that there are places. I mean, like even here in in Leipzig, where sure. where there's a ton of uh, expatriated people from all yeah, over the place who absolutely. are just living here, taking advantage of cheap living, very casual lifestyle, and you know being able to if you're able to telecommute and make sure. money, especially if you have a job. Uh, not speaking from experience or anything, but like if you have a job in London that you're telecommuting to, that would be. Uh, yeah. I, I also think that that's, I think personally being an American, that that's a very different European mentality. This sure. idea of like freedom of movement and, and travel around. That's not really something that is uh, imparted to Americans. No, so much. But I guess that's because America is a continent almost unto itself. Whereas, right. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, the concept of like like a year abroad is um, not near as popular as I think it is for European people to just no. be like, oh, I'm going to go over here and live there for a while. And, because, oh, I'm going to travel around. And because it's, it's a couple of hours flying right, time. It's, right. it's, it's no biggie. I think the other thing that, that also um, greatly affects young people is um, one of the major things that the EU has promoted and, and sometimes against the resistance of the UK are... Um, are progressive issues. So a lot of environmental legislation in the UK has occurred as a result of the EU forcing them to do that. Human rights legislation, the same thing. Uh, let's say gay marriage or, or legislation against torture and so on and so forth. The UK doesn't have a written constitution. It doesn't have a bill of rights like you have in the US. Hmm. So um, it can very much interpret the laws as it wishes or introduce new laws which maybe in the US would fall foul of the Supreme Court or in other countries which have a constitution, the constitutional court would also would knock down. And of course, young people are more receptive to that kind of thing than, than perhaps older people are. One example would be is that most of the, uh, the, the EU um, has a, a system where it ranks the cleanliness of beaches. Mm, okay. And... Um, and uh, British beaches are British beaches are um, much tidier, as are much cleaner. The quality of the water is much um, much better because of the fact that the EU is ins the EU is insisted on doing that. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's... yeah. Don't don't be afraid to grab that mic. Okay, is that it, a bit it, better? Yeah, Sorry, arm moves. Uh, there we you go. just got to lean back a little bit more comfortable. I saw you settle in. There we go. Uh, it's okay, all good. Yeah, good. just force okay. that thing where you want it to be. All right, good. Um, yeah. So the EU does these things all, and and I think young people are quite like, rightly afraid if Britain leaves the EU, there's nothing to stop them for, let's say, from slashing the minimum wage or. Um, allowing businesses to, to pollute more because mm. there's no environmental mm. protection anymore or mm. maybe changing hiring and firing practices so like that severe conservative swing exactly oh. or don't know anything about that no indeed or restricting union rights and things like that all of which is currently protected by eu legislation the british yeah. are compelled by that so yes i think that's why young people are more in favor of staying in the eu all right all right so uh I'm going to ask you to take another shot okay. for me. Okay. Um, so let's get that bottle out because right. now things are going to get a little dodgy. Uh oh. Uh, go ahead, refill me up there. There we go. And uh, yeah, and one for yourself. Cool. Okay. Um, and the, the I'm going to ask you now, and this is why it requires the the lubricant because okay. now we're going to get into a predictive stance. And I want you to tell me. I want you to take a shot at what you think is going to happen next. Oh and my what God. you think the ultimate outcome is going to be. So okay. take a shot at that, would you? Okay. Mm. Man, this is good. I'm going to have to get more. Wow. Of so 
This is a really difficult question. I know it is. And this is a really difficult question. That's all right. Hopefully the buzz is catching on now and, and you can just speak freely about okay. it. Okay. Um, because here's, here's what I think. Yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll go first. Okay. I think that actually what's going to happen is they're going to trip and fall over this a few more times mm. until it triggers. And I don't know how exactly the parliamentary rules work for this. Um, but triggers a vote of no confidence in Theresa May. Yeah. Uh, and the plan gets killed and pushed back to a referendum, and the people vote again. Okay. That's uh, what I think happens. And and when they do vote again, people understand what they vote again uh, for this time. Uh, they vote to stay, or or either that or just the, the slingshot effect drives people out to the polls, and Brits... The, the bit, Brits that didn't vote in the first place or or something like that show up and they're like, yeah, but we're fucking staying. Uh, and the whole thing goes away and we all like, uh, you know, lock it in the tea cupboard and no one ever knows again. <laughs> um, that's one scenario. And it's I would say uh, that's the one that I would wish for. Um, but I'm actually going to take I, I, I'm taking a shot of this and I'm predicting a very, very p pessimistic outcome, which is actually mm -hmm. quite contrary to the way I operate. So here's my here's my thing. Because the, the prime minister is is so hostage to her own party and because party politics plays a huge role in this. And by the way, we just had a vote of no confidence. And although she lost a, she lost the vote on the EU divorce deal, which meant that, you know, 200 members of her own party effectively voted against her. It was like a historic It was it's it's an number. insane the 400 defeat. 400 some odd to 200 some. So that was immediately followed up by a vote a motion of no confidence which was launched by the leader of the opposition. Uh -huh. And every single member of her party and her coalition, well, it's not a coalition partner, but the kind of the party that works together with her, voted to voted down the motion of no confidence because interestingly the thing they fear more then Brexit not happening is the Labour Party getting into power. Yeah, so party oh. politics rules the day. So she is absolutely a hostage of her own party. It's, 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 it, when you see, it, I mean, I use that word actually quite deliberately because sometimes when you see her, her, her speeches to the press, you, it looks like a hostage video. <laughs> it, it, yeah. Reading it, out of the corner it, of her yeah, eye. Yeah, exactly. Of you know, I'm, I'm, I'm checking her eyelids to see if she's morsing something to <laughs> say, you know, please get me out of here. Yeah. Or something like that. But it really, it looks like a hostage oh, video. Man. She is absolutely. There um, are like three tough guys, yeah, arms yeah, crossed yeah. off the side of the stage. Someone's, the you know, got, got a kal uh, Kalashnikov pointed at her head. <laughs> it's, it's that bad. So, She's painted herself so badly in a corner and she is so hostage to her party uh, and a fairly significant section of that party are uh, drinking way too much of the Kool-Aid. Um, they have really convinced themselves that they can actually stick up the middle finger to the EU and walk out without a deal. Just basically say, we're leaving on the 29th of March. There is no deal. We'll sort it out. We're British. Stiff up a lip. We survived the Blitz. We fought them on the beaches. We fought. Yeah, there's a lot of invoking Churchill at, at this time as well. Um, yeah, this is what happens when British politicians, you know, have their backs to the wall. They start to invoke Churchill. It's yeah, and these guys are pygmies <laughs> compared to this person. Oh, man. So um, I think actually what's going to happen is. Uh, there will be a no deal because um, what what she's trying to do now is that she's trying to sort of say to the EU, look, everyone voted against this deal. So clearly this deal is not good enough. So we need to go back to the drawing board and we need to have a better deal that I can sell to my people. And the EU is going to say to them, you're leaving. You decided to leave this. We don't have to do anything for you. OK, huh. we want you to stay. Yeah, but we're not going to let you leave in a way that suits you because then every other country in the EU is like, hey, hang on a minute, how come they get to leave and have a really sweet divorce deal? Right. Yeah. Um, what about us? Oh, so the EU shit. cannot afford to give her what she needs. They cannot afford to do that. And so they're going to dither and dither and dither and dither and dither and then uh, a no deal Brexit is going to happen. Oh, wow. I didn't, then, even, I didn't even for a moment consider the domino effect of yeah. everybody being like, well, they got to go. How come I don't get to go? But it's it's the same. I mean, it's it's if you're leaving the club, you're leaving. You lose all rights to that club. Yeah, it I mean, would that be, just it'd makes be sense. insane, wouldn't it? Yeah. If people actually said, well, if you leave the club, you'll have a better deal than if you're with us. Right. 
The EU will never do that. They can't. But what are what are the things that what what leverage does the EU have? Like it's just trade. It's economic. It's they have. I mean, what they 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 have these 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 four Important. these four freedoms, oh, okay. which is basically it's goods, services, uh, people, and uh, capital. Okay. And so there needs to be the freedom of movement of all these four if you're going to be within the EU. Mm -hmm. And um, there are variations of those four freedoms for, for countries that trade with the EU that have free trade agreements like Switzerland and Norway, which are not actually in the EU. But they still have to sign up to these four freedoms, even though they don't actually get to vote on how that on what the legislation that happens in the EU. And they also have to pay into the EU budget, by the way. They have to mm. contribute financially. Mm -hmm. So it's like being a sort of, I guess, like Puerto Rico, you know, sort of being in the US but not actually being able to say anything in Congress. Okay. Yeah. And so for Britain, that's unacceptable. So then the EU is going to say, well, basically, then you're out. If you want to still trade with us, if you still want to have a relationship with us, then you have to sign up to these principles. There's going to be like tariffs, import-export tariffs, like economical uh, taxation, not taxation, but like. Yeah, you just you're not a part of the free trade club anymore. Yeah. You're not but a it's, part it's, of the free people movement club. You're going to have to start there it is. abiding by visa laws and uh, but but not only that for the last I mean think about all the things that um that the EU shares amongst themselves. So they're talking about shortages of medicine, they're talking about food shortages because if you're checking trucks at the border, then food is not going to get to the supermarkets in time, yeah? Not to mention the fact that for obvious reasons the British version of ice doesn't have enough staff because they don't until now they didn't need that many because basically all of their traffic was coming from the EU now if their traffic is coming from a foreign country in the truest sense of the word they have to check everything coming in so they're going to have to hire oh, huge amounts Lord. of staff the um, motorways to the Ooh. ports are going to be blocked because lorry is going to take two or three days to clear customs um, the EU has a unified um, airline licensing provision so airlines that fly in the EU are basically licensed once as far as I understand that means you can fly in Italy, you can fly in Spain. Britain loses that. That means that British airline companies might not actually be allowed to fly into 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 EU port, uh, well, airports. Definitely, like, and I, oh man, I just the the crashing realization wave of like what arriving at London Heathrow is now versus what it would be if every single person coming in had to go through, you know, customs, through yeah. immigration. Oh, my God. Imagine imagine this. Imagine, oh, God. Imagine if the state of New York seceded from the United States. <laughs> Think about all the things that would have to be implemented to make that work. Well, there, so that's really funny in a way because the first thing that jumps into my mind is the dollar bill, right? right. Because that's the number one thing that, well, and that and military. Yeah, uh, is if if uh, if any state decided to secede from the United States of America, the number one problem you would have is all of a sudden your money's no good. Yeah, and how do you fix that? Yeah, but I think that that's sort of circumvented because they never really fully joined the eurozone. Like that's you fine. take a country like Italy, yeah. right? It would just devastate, of course, the Italian economy. Absolutely, uh, to go back to the euro. Yeah, it would just be insane yeah. to have to deal with. However, I, I've always been a big advocate of countries like Italy, for example. Eh, Italy's maybe not the best example. Greece would have been a better mm. example um, if they could have gotten out. It would have only been maybe like five years, uh, maybe closer to ten years before they were doing great, right? Because yeah. what happens? The economy kind of tanks. Um, everything goes down. There's a great depreciation of the value of currency. Uh, but then a place like Greece, you have all this amazing tourism, uh, food culture, yeah. um, yeah. local agriculture. Like uh, as an American or as a German or as an Italian or anywhere in Europe, you'd be like, let's go to Greece. Our money goes for ages there sure we can get lamb dinner sure. for next to nothing sure uh, and they're going to start making their own money and rebuilding their own economy that yeah, way yeah. too uh, maybe that works in italy maybe it doesn't i mean i think italy was like the fifth largest economy in europe so maybe they're on a, a an edge of that but like greece portugal they could just flip that to their advantage yeah i don't think britain has the ability to flip that to their advantage 
No, definitely not. Because I mean, Britain ma- um, doesn't manufacture much anymore. It yeah. doesn't have much agriculture. It basically, uh, it's a service economy. Yeah, they've, and they've got the American problem. They don't make most, anything, anymore. and it's mostly financial services yeah, as well. Yeah. So the city of London, of course, relies on uh, on on trade with with the EU, on, on financial trade with the mm-hmm. EU. And if if it leaves and that it loses its ability to basically have like a financial free trade. Um, situation, then that's going to be a major problem. But I mean, the list goes on. Of course, is um, I mean, Britain is a sovereign state in that sense. So that's that that wouldn't you wouldn't have to figure out who's British and who's not. But you're already looking at EU citizens, for example, who maybe have lived in the in the UK for twenty, thirty, forty, fifty years, have never decided to take oh, on a yeah. British passport because why would you need to? Yeah, or, or the reverse of that: how many British citizens are living exactly. in, in mainland Europe that exactly. would have to go home? Absolutely, unless if we've got go- some very good friends in that situation. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I, our buddy Sammy is sweating yeah. right now because he has no idea what's going to yeah. happen. It might just be his boot out. Like you got to go home. You got to go back to the island. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, it's awful. And of course, the EU has said quite clearly that what they would like is a regulation that would effectively say that EU residents uh, in the UK and UK residents in the EU would be allowed to stay right. under the same conditions that there would be no change to their status. Yeah, but the British grandfather said, that in. Yeah, yeah, but the British have said, well, we'll have to see about that. And of course, at that point, the EU says, well, if you're going to start to make life difficult for our citizens, we have to respond in kind to British citizens living in our countries. Because, again, they can't, you know, if a German citizen in London is all of a sudden being told, you're going to have to apply for residency, you're going to get three months, and then you have to reapply and reapply and reapply, and maybe in six years we'll give you permanent residency, he's A, going to get lost and go back to where he came from, or that's a huge extra burden that he takes on, and he's going to say to his government, what are you doing about that? And, of course, his government can say, well, fine, then we have to do the same thing for British people living in our country. So, Mm. all right, Brits, you you used to be able to live here and work here without any restrictions whatsoever. But because your home country is messing around with our citizens, we're going to have to uh, apply the thumbscrews. And it's just... and, And, of course... The, the the huge tragedy of there is that the people in charge in the UK genuinely believe that they are in a position of power. And that is the most insane delusion that they have, that somehow the EU, a continent of 500 million people, is going to cower before an island of 60 million people, Yeah. Well, it's uh, not even the people, right? It's the Yeah, government. but even the governments as well, that they're, they're going to, that they have somehow this... It's. I mean, I basically said it's a little bit like, you know, uh, Britain is holding a gun to its head and saying, if you don't do what I say, I'm going to pull the trigger. And expecting, it's and we the, say, no, 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 stop, 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 whatever you want, whatever you want. saddles, yes. right? Like, ah, yeah, nobody move. Yeah, it's literally, <laughs> it's literally like that. And this delusion of grandeur goes back to the days of the empire. The British have really failed to understand that they won the war, but they lost the peace, mm. Yeah. The World War II was their last blaze of glory. That was it. It was game over. And they haven't adjusted. It was, I think it was a Swedish politician who recently said, there are two types of countries, uh, small countries and small countries that don't realize they're small countries yet. <laughs> and Britain <laughs> belongs to the latter. Yeah, They haven't quite figured out. They're a small nation. Hmm. Yeah, they are a small nation. They are by not the most populous nation by far in the EU, not the most, uh, not the biggest economy in the EU. The only thing that they have is nuclear weapons. Hmm. Yeah, and if I look at the way things work in in the UK at the moment, I wouldn't even guarantee those nuclear weapons would work or be able to deliver on time or. The, well, yeah, it's definitely not going to get you anywhere. No, in, in exactly. The state of the world. I mean, North Korea has nuclear weapons, and we don't consider that to be a superpower. Well, yeah, we we also don't know that they can get them like any further than their own doorstep. That's but also true. That's, that's also true. Yeah, I, I don't think that uh, I don't think that the UK is going to be bombing themselves out of the European Union, though. I don't think so either. I don't think so either. But it's just it's extraordinary that they genuinely think that they hold all the cards that yeah. they can just really you know just push it to the limit, you know, just engage in some serious brinkmanship. And at some point the EU is going to say, okay, you got us. All right, whatever, fine. Yeah. Take what you need. Just, 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 just don't hurt <laughs> us. The EU at this point is saying, dudes, we don't care anymore. Just, just, 
make up your minds and get out. Do yeah? it or don't. Do it or don't. I yeah. can't help but notice you're like caressing that bottle. You want to take a shot at wrapping I'll take, up this I'll take conversation? One more shot. I'll take one more shot. Yeah. All right. Well, let's, take a, let's take a shot at closing this show out. Uh, you can listen to I'll Take a Shot at That on any of the podcast publication platforms such as Google Play, iTunes, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, uh, the new Pandora podcast platform, and many, many more. Fans of the podcast can personally support its creation by visiting patreon.com slash shot at that and becoming a patron for as little as $1 a month. In the world of free things on the internet, we know no one actually has to give us any money at all, but your support means you are part of the population that understands that quality entertainment has real value. So we hope you've enjoyed the show. We also rock out on all the best time-wasting social media platforms there are, including facebook.com slash shot at that, twitter.com slash shot at that, instagram.com slash shot at that, or simply tag us with at shot at that. We'd love to hear from you. And of course, you can always go straight to the source, W www.takeashotatthat.com where you can find all of our archived episodes all of our contact information comment sections and much much more Justin I thank you very much for joining us again it's been an absolute pleasure let's take a shot at closing this down okay cheers buddy cheers ah that was good